Hi, my name's Emily Hawkins and I'm the author of this book, A Natural History of Fairies. It's illustrated by Jessica Rue and it's published by Corto. Today I'm in the Corto classroom to introduce the book to you and to teach you a little bit about biology. Now, biology is a science which is involved with the study of living things, so the study of plants and animals. You might think it's a bit weird that I'm going to use a book about fairies to teach you about science. But this isn't just any book about fairies. This book describes fairies as real-life creatures who live alongside animals as part of the natural world. When we talk about the activity a bit later on, we're going to learn some important words that biologists use when they're studying animals. So, by the end of this lesson, you'll be thinking and talking like a biologist. This is the kind of book that you don't necessarily have to read all the way through from beginning to end in order. You can dip in and out, look at the pictures and read bits and pieces of text as they take your fancy. Today, I'm going to read a few pages to you just to give you a flavour of what it's all about. Then I'm going to ask you to invent your own species of fairy. This book starts with a letter from a character called Professor Elsie Arbor, and it's written to her goddaughter Annabelle in 1925, which is about 100 years ago. The character of Professor Arbor is a botanist, which means that she's an expert on plants but you'll find that she's also a bit of an expert on fairies as well. The whole book is presented as having been written by Professor Arbor, so it's a compilation of everything she's learnt about fairies and the science of fairy life, which includes things like their anatomy, the way their bodies are put together, and their life cycle, and the different habitats they might live in, and how they survive in the wild. Okay, let's have a look inside. Okay, so I'm going to show you a few pages from inside so you can see a bit more of this beautiful artwork. My dear Annabelle, as you know, during my career I have made a name for myself studying plants, travelling the globe to learn everything I could about flowers and trees. However, what you do not know is that in the course of my work, I stumbled upon a new area of study, one that in recent years has become my true passion. I've gone to great lengths to keep this work a secret. I fear that if its real nature were known, I would be mocked by my colleagues and labelled a fool. This secret work, my dear one, is the study of fairies. Fairies are all around us, but they're shy creatures that can be very hard to find. You may have been lucky enough to see one already, at the bottom of your garden perhaps, or even in the attic. I have compiled this book as a guide to the different species of fairy around the world. Within these pages you will discover where and how fairies live, their role in the natural world and how to find them. I am about to embark on a voyage to South America where I will journey into the depths of the Amazon rainforest to search for the little known hummingbird fairy. This expedition will be fraught with danger, so before I depart, I'm sending you my book for safekeeping. Perhaps it will inspire some fairy-finding adventures of your own. With all my love, Aunt Elsie. We're going to read a little bit about meadow and garden fairies. Bursting with fragrant flowers and leafy hiding places, gardens and meadows are like playgrounds to fairies. Most fairies prefer flower beds and borders that have been left to grow a little wild. Garden fairies are the type of fairy most commonly spotted by humans, especially children who sometimes come across them while playing outside. So here we have the sweetbriar fairy. Sweetbriar fairies spend, spend the spring and summer looking after roses, removing diseased leaves and keeping pests away. When autumn comes, they tuck into a feast of nutritious rose hips before curling up and hibernating for the winter months. This is the peacock fairy. One of the most commonly seen fairies can often be spotted buzzing alongside honeybees around fragrant lavender bushes. I have come across peacock fairies in my own garden who appear to show very little fear of humans. 
and each fairy has a little fact file which gives some more information about it. So the peacock fairy's habitat is anywhere lavender grows, its home is a crevice in a garden rockery or a burrow in sandy soil, it has large eye spots on its wings similar to a peacock butterfly's. These look like the eyes of an owl which may help frighten away birds of prey. Peacock fairies appear to have a close relationship with honeybees, sometimes helping them collect pollen and nectar. And here the little woodbine fairy. Woodbine fairies spend their days looking after plants. They literally have green fingers. Perhaps this inspired the term used to describe human gardeners. In springtime, apple tree fairies bustle amongst the blossoms, caring for the tree. They're tricky to spot because their beautifully stitched clothes help them blend in with their surroundings. Sleepy and slow moving, the pepper pot fairy is the lazy bones of the fairy world. This may be because of its diet of poppy seeds, which cause drowsiness. These fairies move very slowly, which helps them avoid being spotted by birds of prey. Now we're just going to read a little bit about fairy homes. Fairies live in all sorts of homes, from carefully woven nests or tree trunk hollows to underground burrows. Like the tailor bird, some fairies stitch together leaves to make their homes. Many fairies build themselves treetop nests using sticks, twigs and grasses. Some fairies gather together discarded feathers or wool from sheep's fleeces to line their nests. Hollows in tree trunks make ideal homes for fairies, although they sometimes face stiff competition for these from birds and grey squirrels. Some species build their own burrows, others move into abandoned animal burrows or even cohabit with rabbits and mice. Then we can look at the little firefly sprite here. This remarkable Asian fairy has an impressive skill. It can glow in the dark. The firefly sprite is bioluminescent, which means that parts of its body light up. It's thought that the fairies use this light as a form of defence to warn off predators, but it might be that the light simply helps them see in the dark. And this little one, the young of fairies are called flutterpillars. And it says here, the flutterpillar of the firefly sprite has a glowing tail like a glow worm. So the habitat of the firefly sprite is the bamboo forests of China. It often makes a nest from bamboo leaves or it lives in the abandoned burrow of a bamboo rat. It has glowing wings and extra large eyes. And the firefly sprite is nocturnal, which means it only comes out at night. On certain summer evenings, hundreds of these little fairies emerge, darting and flickering through the rustling bamboo groves. Okay. So now you've learned a little bit about lots of different types or species of fairy. We had so much fun putting this book together and dreaming up all the different kinds of fairy that might live in different habitats around the world. And now it's your turn. So I'd like you to invent your own species of fairy. To do this, you first need to think about the type of place your fairy might live, its habitat. So this could be maybe a garden or a park in your local area, a woodland or forest, maybe the mountains, maybe a coastal area, a swamp or even the freezing cold Arctic or the Antarctic. Once you've decided what kind of habitat your fairy might live in, you'll need to think about its home. So this could be a nest in a tree or a burrow underground, just like some of the fairy homes we looked at in the book. It could be a hole in a riverbank or maybe the inside of a flower. You obviously need to make sure that its home matches its habitat. So no flowery nests at the North Pole. Then you can have some fun with what your fairy might look like. It's features. So what kind of clothes does it wear? Are they made from maybe the leaves or petals of a plant that grows in its habitat? Maybe it's camouflage to blend into its environment. What are its wings like? Maybe they look similar to a particular type of butterfly or moth from your local area. Or maybe they look totally original and beautiful. 
So while we're talking about features, I'm just going to mention an important word for biologists, which is adaptations. So an adaptation is a particular way that an animal's body helps it survive in its habitat. This is something you'll often come across in the natural world. For example, if you look at creatures that live in really cold oceans like seals and whales and polar bears, one of their adaptations is blubber, which is the layer of fat under the skin um, that keeps them warm. Or if you look at creatures who live in the desert, they have adaptations too that help them survive in these really hot and sandy habitats. So a camel has really long eyelashes to help keep the sand and dust out of its eyes. What kind of adaptations might your fairy have to help it survive in its habitat? Okay, so the last thing I'm going to ask you to think about is your fairy's behaviour. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean whether it's a good fairy or a naughty fairy. No, this kind of behaviour is another biologist's word you can use when talking about particular ways that different creatures act. So animal behaviours might include things like um, whether it hibernates during the winter or whether it migrates to somewhere warmer or whether it uses special defence tactic tactics like working as a team to protect itself from predators. Hopefully you will have some fun thinking about the behaviour of your type of fairy. Maybe it's nocturnal and it only comes out at night. Maybe it has a special relationship with a different kind of creature like a bird maybe or a mouse or something. Maybe they sort of work together and help each other. Um, perhaps it has a, a relationship with a type of plant and it looks after a particular kind of plant or maybe it has a really interesting way of defending itself from predators. So four main things to think about when you're dreaming up your fairy. It's habitat, it's home, it's features and finally it's behaviour. Then you can draw your fairy and you could maybe give it some little labels as well to describe its different features. On the Quarto website, you can download this template and print it out to work from if you'd like. So this has space for your species name at the top and then your fairy drawing here. Then it has this little section at the bottom where you can make some notes on habitat, home, features, and this bit includes adaptations and behaviour. When you've finished, I would love to see what you've come up with. If one of your grown-ups has access to Instagram, you can share your work and tag me at Emily Hawkins Books, and don't forget to add the hashtag Quarto Classroom. I really hope you've enjoyed finding out a bit more about the book. I absolutely loved working on it, and I hope that you're gonna love it too. It's available wherever books are sold and it's packed full of everything you've ever wanted to know about fairies and about fairy science. Thanks so much for joining me today and I hope you have fun inventing some amazing fairies. Bye.